So as you know, I have been praying. I have to say a couple of things just for people that are new listening online, first time visit, et cetera. As you know, I have been praying about what to do since uh, we inherited this building. And so that'll be probably a couple of month process. You know, I mean, you know, every day now is just loads of paperwork and switch. And, and so it is different because they're not selling us the building, they're giving us the building. So there has to be a name change. <sighs> yeah, all of that. I'm not, I didn't bring that way because it's, I mean, it's, it's going perfectly smooth. Yeah, it's going perfectly smooth, you know, because you can't, you can't rush things. It's just, you know, it was the Lord that did it over 12 years. So now we ought to rush him in a week. You know, that doesn't make any sense. And so just let everything fall in place. But it's, it's powerful because um, the, the pastor who was over this, he used to pastor a church called Mableton Church of God. And so he uh, and so he came over here and he took that church, brought it here, and then he renamed the church Highest Praise Church of God. So when he had to rename it, they told him, go see this particular person at this particular bank. And so uh, his name is, well, I probably shouldn't mention the man's name, but, uh, but uh, he's old school. He's been in banking for 50 years. And so, uh, you know, when we first started as a church, you know, uh, we did one small $30,000 loan just to establish credit. And so uh, since for that, for 12 years, we've never, we've never had to borrow money or anything. But we did that just to establish credit. And so, so um, and, and, and this particular gentleman, because he's been in banking so long, he's old school. It's like, well, I won't mention the name, but I kind of already put the W out there. They just denied me. Begged me to get the loan, then denied me when they, and, and so, so, so that guy who pastors this, he was told to go see this gentleman at this particular bank. And so when I met with him, he told me, go see this same particular gentleman at this particular bank. And so now that the switch is switching over again, that particular gentleman who's been in banking for 50 years, who is a Christian born again believer, he's the one that's doing the merge. So that there won't be no shaky foolishness. So, and the cool thing is, is that that banker, he's impressed with both of us as pastors and he knows both of us have integrity like he does. And so, but he's one of those guys where he, he will, he, he's old school. You, you want this $100,000 loan? Mm-hmm. And so what he does is he pulls you into his office, tell me your story. I'm not interested in computers determining whether or not you're ready or not. I want to hear your story. I want to feel it in my gut. I want to look at it and look in your eyes. So he's that type of guy. And so he's the one that's handling everything. So everything is going smooth. Everything is going smooth. You know, it's a lot to, you know, you know you've been in one mindset. And then, you know, you go from this room to the whole thing. <clears throat> so uh, so, so the, the thing I'm doing now is trying to get the whole building on the inside of me. You know what I'm saying? So I can accurately determine certain things. And so, uh, but it's the Lord's doing. So, ba you know, based on us having Saturday here and then an entirely different congregation Sundays in Riverdale. And then now with this man giving me his whole building and his sanctuary and his church and his, their assets and a blueprint to tack on another minimum 1,000 seats to this big building. It's already zoned and approved for it. And so I was like, well, Lord, how am I supposed to do this? Because if I have to inherit another congregation, it's not fair for me to do a flip-flop back and forth. You know, some pastors do that, and maybe uh, I can't judge anybody. Maybe some got a word, but some didn't. They're trying to build an empire. And, and God is interested in building an empire, but let him build it yeah. instead of you trying to build it. And so, so I was just like, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Because it's not fair for me to inherit a new congregation and not be there every week. But I got the Riverdale Sunday location, so now I got a Saturday morning service, and I got two Sunday morning services at the same time. And so, as you know, I just begin to pray. And um, how you know, sometimes when you pray, the Lord doesn't answer immediately. That's where that term came from. He may not come when you want to, but he's always right on time. That right on time is questionable, depending on what point of view you're coming from. You know, so, so that's what I begin to do. So I'm not saying I made a mistake, but it's possible, possible that I did make a mistake. Um, it's possible also, when I say mistake, in regards to demanding God speak to me a particular way. Okay. Another mistake I could have made is, is that we went to the mountains and I just, you know, how many know you can be doing the right thing, right thing, right thing, and then you just get off track? You're reading the Bible, reading the Bible, and it seemed like it's months since you read it. You're praying, you're praying, praying, and then one day you look up, am I even a Christian? I haven't even talked to Jesus in two months. You know what I'm saying? 
And so we all have those battles. And then, you know, it's about like my wife and I say, you know, when you're driving a car down the street, you're, you're, you're making constant adjustments like this. Why? Because the moment you stop making adjustments, you crash within a minute. And that's in a brand new car on a perfectly straight road. So you got to always make adjustments. And so people say, what's the key to balance? There is no balance. Keep making adjustments. Amen. Everybody want all these perfect principles. No, one day is good. Another day is crazy. And God's grace and patience makes the difference. I always tell him, the time for God to be mad at you and kill you, and, and, and that's when you were living in sin. You know what I'm saying? That's, he didn't kill you when you were living in sin. Now you're trying to do stuff for you. Now he's trying to kill you. It doesn't make any sense. But there are some pastors, they want you to go to hell. It's getting real deep out here in these streets, as the kids say. But anyway, so I just begin to pray about that. And so, and so, and, and the only reason I'm, so I'm in a period of, I mean, how many of you know in the Bible before the, whenever someone was getting ready to do a great thing, God would encourage them to have courage, but he would also rebuke them to be careful. And so, you know, so there are some things the Lord is rebuking me about. And God's rebukes are for the purpose of you being better, not for the purpose of you feeling bad. And so, 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 because and so, for some of you that's been Christians, maybe a little bit mature, have you ever had this experience where you were just doing something, something came out of your mouth as a statement, but you're like, why did I say that? Sometimes, see, we're used to, this is going to sound a little weird, we are used to the Holy Spirit giving someone a word and then you give it to another man or woman. There are times when something will come out of your mouth and it was the Holy Spirit using your tongue to give you a word. And so I was just minding my own business and I heard myself say this the other morning, woe unto the man that is spiritually empty. And that was a personal word for me. Son, get on top of this. Get on top of this. I remember years ago when I fell into this, I had a dream and in the dream, it was just, a, I was in a room, like a kitchen, I think it was a kitchen, and, and I was trying to paint the wall. And you ever paint it and the paint, you had to put on another coat? So I painted the wall, but the original paint, which was old, bled through. And so I put on another coat and it bled through again. And then I took the roller and I just goo gobbed that roller into the paint, just stuck it like syrup. And that was the Lord telling me, you're gonna have to saturate yourself in the word. Just, just, just you know, see what I'm saying? So it's amazing how the Lord does these things to get our attention. So, so this is where I am when I'm praying. We went to the mountains, and I had made, and because, uh, and then let me say this, and, 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 and I'm going to maybe put the cart before the horse here. So as you know, our spiritual dad is Bishop David Oudipo. And see, uh, what my request to the Lord is paying off now. When, before I started the church, I said, Lord, I don't want this stuff that I've been under. That stuff is prideful, is arrogant, and it's going nowhere. And I see where this is going. And what I saw is actually happening right now to them. And so I said, I want somebody that has got like longevity, no drama. You know, I want somebody that carries themselves in humility. So that's when the dreams actually started with Bishop David Oudipo. Now, um, I mentored myself under Yonggi Cho, even though I met him and talked to him in Korea. Um, of course, of course Oudipo, that's our family now. But here's a lesson that you have to learn for you all that are going to be called to ministry and do things in the future. So, so I'll just put that, I'll just, it's probably, I probably should have shared it later, but I'll do it now. So one of the things that was amazing to me is, you know, Bishop Oudipo's spot, his first spot, is on 15,000 acres of land. You don't even know how much land that is. So, so put it this way, when we get there, we go through an entrance like a checkpoint, like you're going into another country with security, bomb detectors under your car, ask you questions, uh, chips, it's all of that. So, so, so the, um, I would probably say, so it's three stages. You have the church stage. You got to drive through that stage and you get lost. I went walking one time and just literally got lost. I didn't know where I was. Papa and mama, they thought that was so hilarious. They were laughing and falling out of their chair and everything. When I told them, my man, I walked around this place and I got lost. And so then you have the second phase on their land, which is the whole campus. The whole college universities, now is a lawyer training center, a hospital. Just, it's just crazy. Then you go through the third phase from the college university to where they're building the homes where we have a home, the apartments and stuff like that. The, it takes one mile to get from one, the gate from the university property 
to the gate to the neighborhood is one mile. Okay, now I shared all of that to say you have to be very careful. Um, but I'll read the scripture, then I'll tell you the story. No, I'm not. I'll tell you the story first. <laughs> and so, so this is, I pay attention to things like that. So they were maxed out. They were looking for more land to go build, buy something, whatever. So it was his ministers that say, sir, we were praying along with you, and we found the land. He said, okay, take me out there. And so um, there's a valuable lesson about humility. They took him out there. He said the longer he drove, the, the, the more angry he got. In his mind, he's like, why are they taking me out here way out to Beirut someplace? He said, they're just driving, and they're just driving. And the longer they went, the more angry he got. And so, and then they took him to a spot, which was nothing but a forest, called the Witch's Forest, by the way. You were known not to be in that area after 5 p.m. Voices start coming out that place. And so, and so they got out of the car, smiling. This is it. He said, he was start raving mad. He said, you mean to tell me? He said, we drove all the way out here. He said, first of all, how are the people going to get out here that far? Apparently, God didn't have any concern about that. He said, first of all, second of all, he said, y'all brought me out here to a place. This is a forest, the witch's forest, and there are no roads. There is no running water, no electricity. He said, this is impossible. He said, he was just angry. And they were like, this is it. He said, no, it's not. He said, but as you know, we always must give in everything, give God thanks. So he said, let's form a circle. Let's hold hands. And he began to give God thanks. And the Lord interrupted his raggedy prayer and told him, you the one that's off. This is the place. Now, people are like, oh, hallelujah, not me. I took a mental note. A man on that level that has the biggest thing in planet Earth that increases by 20 to 30,000 people a month in raw membership built, did, opened up 15,000 churches during COVID. Not 15,000 satellites, 15,000 real churches around the world and put 15,000 pastors over those churches. It added $10 million to the budget. He did that during COVID. A man who walks in another dimension than I am makes me feel like I'm not even saved. And yet, when he walked on the land, not even his spirit gave him peace. That was it. Y'all understand where I'm going? So no matter what level you are on, you can always miss it at any time. And this is the deep part. Everybody else had it, but he angry. Everyone else sensed it. He didn't sense nothing. He was like, this can't be it. And it wasn't until he prayed, God had to speak to my, cause my, I told my wife, I said, you would have thought a man full of the presence of God would have got on that land and felt, wait a minute, this might be the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? Didn't feel nothing. So I was being, so because of that, um, I was being very sensitive in this regards. I did, but, and, and so I look at things like that and I said, okay, that shows how if you are not sensitive, you can make a mistake. Now, because of that, I had made a demand. You're going to speak to me. I ain't interested in no prophecies, no turtle doves sitting on my edge of the windowsill, no homing pigeons, none of that. I said, you are going to speak to me in an audible voice. He was like, is that right? So I just began to pray, and I began to relax because I said, okay, cool. So let me just give you this. And then, so let me read the scripture, and then we'll do this. Psalm 103.7, he made his ways, made known his ways unto Moses, but his acts unto the children of Israel. So God has acts that you can be familiar with, and he has ways. Most people are not familiar with his ways. Most Christians, most pastors, most prophets are not familiar with his ways. They're familiar with his actions. And that's why most teaching you hear is about won't God do it? He's going to heal. Nothing wrong with that. He's going to heal you. He's going to prosper you. He's going to make a way. He paid off the bill. He showed me what to do. Those are actions. So let me give you the definition. Here are the two definitions. Acts has to do with doings, works, deeds. Won't he do it? Actions. Acts, inventions. There are some things I watched my wife. He invented a, when she had to go to Bible school, he invented a position for her on her job. Didn't exist. You'd be surprised how many inventions per time have been created in your every day. You'd be surprised how many roads were created and you didn't know. You'd be surprised that there have been times that they multiplied money in your bank account, but they didn't let you know that it multiplied. You'd be surprised how many inventions are going on where they are creating things 
you know, sometimes the car next to you is not really a car. But I'll get over into that. That's some other stuff. Y'all got me. So that's Acts. Ways is, is way. Road, distance, journey, the manner in which someone does it. What did God say? He said, my ways are not yours. My thoughts are not yours. And see, and, and most people, they equate God with planet Earth. Y'all do realize he's not human. And he doesn't breathe air. Not that we're you when you get to heaven, but that's a deeper teaching too. But, but, but he has a way in which he does things. And so most leaders, the way in which they follow the Lord is the way in which they saw some other preacher do something. Because when the Lord leads you a particular way, you're going to seem foreign to all of planet Earth. Y'all got me? So as I began to pray, the first thing that happened was that we were at the Riverdale site. We were doing an hour of prayer before the service. And Devon, as I walked past, he leaned up and said something like this. He said, you know, he said, we probably just built the foundation over here for someone else to come and take it over. And I was like, huh. Now, as I was walking past, he leaned forward and said that. When he leaned back, he said to himself, why would you sit up there and say that to that man? Now, the fact that he said that is what made me pay attention to the fact that he questioned why would he say it, which means it wasn't you who said it. So you, you got to have a certain level of wisdom and sensitivity with this stuff, y'all. And I'm teaching you how to navigate through life. It's not stuff that's not for preachers, it's for children. And all preachers are children. I don't know why I'm saying stuff like that, but I'm always saying stuff. Okay, so, so I took a mental note and kept on praying. Now, in case you didn't know this, when we first went to Riverdale, we opened this up. Six months later, the Lord told me to open up Riverdale. My wife and I were at Popeye's, a place that we don't frequent that often, but that was the day. She so over there tearing up that chicken. And, and I told Lauren, I said, I said, it's weird. I said, like in big block letters, the Lord is telling me to open up a church in Riverdale. So we opened up six months later. There was no budget. We walked in here with seven people. Seven. And there was no budget for Riverdale, Okay. But we opened it anyway. When we opened it, mysteriously, another $3,000, $4,000 a month starts showing up with a new church that's only open six months. And so when you, when, and see, when the Lord tells you to do something, if you know the Lord, you have to do it first before the stuff shows up. Oh, Lord, I'm teaching on multiple. Okay. So, so now when we went over there, we couldn't move an inch. History of Riverdale, that they had lost their accreditation with the schools. Churches had closed. Pastors told me to my face, sir, you can't build a church in Riverdale. It won't work. I said, really? It won't work, huh? Okay. That's yeah, not something you should tell me. Okay. But anyway, so we went over there, and I remember the first prayer meeting we did, one of the prophetic people said that they saw in the spirit that as we were praying, black curtains were being pulled off the building. There are weapons that the enemy uses to block access. You know, you know, you'd pull the Satan had put a thing around his building, <clears throat> and he had to speak to it, and, and, and it left like a spaceship. But uh, so... You know, so we begin, crawl, so Devon shout out, was it three years or was it four years we went over there every Thursday? Four, four years we were, went over there every Thursday and we were just meeting in the back room just praying. Boom, boom. Because there are two Hindu temples in Riverdale. Right. Riverdale is a small city. That's mysterious that they got two Hindu temples. There's a Buddhist one right down the street. So you got three demigods in a small area locking that down. And see, so they be blaming the process. They be blaming it on gangsterism, racism, communism, ghettoism. They'll be blaming it on all that type of stuff. No, it's called demonism. Coming from the Hinduism. That's that is y'all know what I'm saying. That's where it was coming from. And, and so and so you remember, uh, the devil thrives on poverty, sickness, and disease, strife. It, they thrive on that. So they, they'll and behind the scenes, they'll they'll work through a beautiful temple in order to make the physical realm ugly. And so the, so we will be able to just boom, boom, just knocking down strongholds. You if you could pull back, pull back this veil, you would see us, you would see us like remote control controlling angels and wars were going on. Boom, boom, boom. And at times the Lord would show Devon what area of the city we had dismantled what demonic kingdom had been dealt with. So we did that, did that. And then mysteriously, after four years, it's like everybody's talking about Riverdale, like, what's going on in Riverdale? The, the roads are paved, all of these new beautiful buildings, the school, the church is showing up in droves. So 
Um, so keep that mental note. So then we went to the mountains. You know, was it last week or the week before last? Week before last, we went to the mountains. That was wonderful. We were ocean people, so we love going to the ocean, huh? Oh, we love the ocean, so, but now I'm ocean and mountain. I mean, just, I mean, just sitting out there, breathing that, looking across the landscape, and just breathing that fresh air, and yeah. And so we're just out there, just praying, getting built up, praying. I mean, I think, in, you know, I think Tuesday, or Tuesday, I read the entire book of Job, 42 chapters. And I'm just cranking with the word, spending time in prayer. And when we left that place, we were so just, oh, we felt so good. I'm giving you the revelation about why we're closing the Riverdale Church. Sorry, I forgot to put that up front. It's not closing, it's just merging. It's a difference. And so, so Tuesday night, I have a dream. And the dream ends by I'm preaching in the larger sanctuary in this building, which is formerly highest praise. And I'm talking to the highest praise people. And then I look up and I see the Riverdale Church sitting in the audience. And then, um, and then sometimes the Lord will use a face to represent. And so many of y'all know Nisi, that Charles and Nisi, they go to the Riverdale location. And so, so Nisi was, I looked at Nisi in the audience, and for some reason I gave her instruction to leave, to go do something, probably something that had to do with a demon or something. So she left, and as she left, I, the dream ended by me saying this to the congregation. Y'all Riverdale folk, come down here and give a hug to all your new family members that you're going to be fellowshipping with every week in a couple of weeks. Came out the dream. That's not good enough, Jesus. I told you I ain't trying to hear no dream. I need you to speak. <laughs> look, at this, look at this stupid boy. We're going to say that again. That's how serious I was about not messing this up. You know, I mean, I mean, you're the, there are levels you get to. You make one wrong turn. And, 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 and when, if you make that wrong turn, it doesn't become right if you keep going wrong. And the longer you go, the more wrong it becomes. But the problem is if you preach the word, you can get results preaching the word on the wrong road. And the results are never a sign that you're doing the right thing. Witchcraft gets results. But anyway, that's... So I did that, and I came up the room and told my wife, guess what happened last night? She was like, really? I was like, yep. She's like, well. I said, that's not good enough. Mm -mm, nope. I said, the Bible says, I'm quoting the word to God now, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. We're not doing it until I get three. Okay. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, <laughs> my wife said, I believe I know what we're supposed to do. Ladies, very much wisdom, she says, but I'm not going to tell you until you get it first. Okay. Okay. She says, when you believe you get it, you'll tell it, and then I'll tell you what I have. Right. So we left the mountains. Lord ain't saying nothing. And then I said something. This requires wisdom. <laughs> you know, so Resurrection Sunday was that pastor's last time preaching here. He said, I'm preaching, and then I'm driving off into the sunset. I mean, when I tell you they are done, they are done, like burnt chicken done. I mean, they are done. <laughs> and they, they've been, he been, he been in the ministry. He's been preaching since, since 18. And they married as teenagers, and they've been doing this since they've been teenagers. And, and they're in their 60s now. And, and he said, I'm, he's, and this is what he said. He said, I'm not done preaching. He said, but I'm done pastoring. He said, that's never going to happen again. And then it's, something happened with his health. And, and I'm very serious when, so when he announced me, this is another, so when he announced me to the congregation um, three weeks ago, March 17th, see, that's why you have to have, it's not good for a man to be alone because he can't remember nothing. <laughs> Even though I created the man perfect, still not good for him to be alone. So March 17th, he asked me to come. He would introduce me to the congregation. So he told them the story about how the Holy Ghost told him I was the one. He introduces me at the end. So. That morning, Sunday morning, before we come to the church, the Holy Spirit gives me a word. He said, the word that you are to give to the congregation is that their pastor built the foundation for your success. The word that I gave them is, how many of you know that um, Solomon built the temple that David could not build? Solomon built it, but the Bible talks more about David than it does Solomon. I said, how many of you know that Elisha did double than Elijah? He did more miracles, but the Bible talks more about Elijah. 
I said, how many of you know that Joshua went and took over all of that land that Moses couldn't do for 40 years? But the Bible talks more about Moses than the... See, so, man, they caught that and started speaking in tongues and everything. And I said, so remember, remember that I'm getting ready to do something crazy. I'm getting ready to do some crazy exploits. I said, but it will be your pastor that will get more credit than me because I could not do it if he didn't build the foundation. That wrecked the church. They were like, this is our new fearless leader. This is it, Jesus. We're going higher. Okay. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost gave me that. They're very, very powerful. See the honor and all of that? You see the honor and all that? Okay. So that's the word that I gave to them. So where I'm at in the story now. So I don't even know where I am. Yeah, he left. Oh, so I told my wife, I said, so the Lord hasn't given me the, th he, didn't, he didn't already spoke twice. The Lord hasn't given me the third word that I want. I said, but technically in the spirit, until he walks off that pulpit on Resurrection Sunday, the Lord is not obligated to tell me anything because it still belongs to him. How many know Elisha didn't walk in any power until Elijah was gone? Joshua didn't step foot into the promised land until Moses had died. Y'all see that principle? See, this is what they're talking about, the ways of the Lord. The church knows nothing about his ways. They just know church services. And the ways are right there in Scripture. You, you, you just got to see it. You know what I'm saying? And you just follow the same pattern. So, so he preaches Resurrection Sunday. I preach Resurrection Sunday. You know, isn't it fun to be able to preach the journey while you're on the journey? Yeah, this is kind of... And so... So the Lord ain't said nothing. We get home, and I'm backing the chariot into the driveway. And when I put it in park, I couldn't see him, but there was an angel standing next to my vehicle. And would you like to know what he was telling me? Ask your wife what she thinks. Okay. That thing was so strong. That thing was so strong. And then in my mind, I'm like, what? I mean, it's like you could feel the man standing next to me. There are many, the whole, according to scripture, the sometimes what you heard was more an angel than it was the Holy Spirit. Some of you all read the Bible, you remember the story of Philip? The Holy Ghost gave him one instruction, and then the angel gave him a second instruction. See, so, so, uh, but some, so that proves, amongst other things, including the whole Bible, that angels speak. And sometimes they will, they will reveal themselves to you as an angel. Sometimes they will appear as a human. And other times they will not appear. They'll whisper something in your ear. So he was there. He said, ask your wife what she thinks. And I just, and so now I'm kind of pitter-pattering around the bush and everything, you know. And so I finally said, so, hey, Lorana, so I'm, I don't know what I said crazy. And, and my wife's reply was, well, uh, no, I'm not going to tell you that until you tell me what the Lord said. And so I put pressure, and I said, no, nah, I think you need to tell me. I think you need to tell <laughs> I ain't said nothing about no angel yet. <laughs> That's how the brothers are. They try to hide it, you know, trying to make it seem like it was their idea. <clears throat> I told her after she told me. So, she, she, so this is what my wife said. She said, well, this is what I have. She says, I believe that Riverdale is supposed to close. It's supposed to be merged into Austell. It's supposed to be, instead of it being two church locations, it's, it's one church with two different services. And she said, and I also believe that Riverdale is supposed to stay put for about a month so that we can minister the highest praise alone. Okay. And instead of just coming over and, uh, you know, they would stay put. That gives me four weeks to just talk to them, prep them, get used to them, you know. So everybody got to stay put, okay. So we'll get to that later, you know. But uh, so I said, thank you. I ain't say nothing about no angel. No, I just said thank you. And I went upstairs, you know, upstairs. And I just sat there on the couch for a second and I just thought about it. And then I came back to her and I said, okay, you know, that's what we're going to do. And then I told her about the angel and she already knew about the dream. She already knew about Devon. And so I said, okay, that's the decision that I make. So I called Devon back. I said, hey, Devon, this is the decision that I'm making. I said, I believe I've heard from God. So this is that decision. He said, cool. Now, meanwhile, back at his ranch, the Holy Ghost had told him to pray for an hour every day until I made the decision. Okay. So he had to get up before the prayer call at 6, and he had to pray every day from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. until without any motive. Your job is to pray for one hour until I get the answer. So when I called him back and let him know what the answer was, he says, well, now let me tell you what the Holy Ghost told me. 
He said, I was praying, minding my own business. He said, I had no agenda. On, I, he said, I didn't even think about it. He said, I was praying in the Holy Ghost. And he said, and this is what the Spirit of God said, Riverdale merged into Austell. I said, well, we'd have moved past two or three witnesses now. We're now going over into dreams and prophetic encounters and all that type of stuff. And so, uh, and so, and so, and I'm just teaching you how to do things. I said, okay. Bible says out of two or three witnesses, I have peace. And, and, and it's important to have the right people around you. I know my wife hears from God. I know Devon hears from God. Devon was the one we were riding to Riverdale to pray. And this is not exaggeration. This is how he did it. We just riding in the car to go to Riverdale to pray. Just how he did it. Something is coming. <laughs> right after that, COVID showed up. So you need people in your life like that, Amen. that are connected to God for real. Y'all remember Daniel? You, you, they were all getting ready to die. And what did Daniel say? He called his close friends, who the Bible says were just as righteous as he was. And he said, we need to all pray. And because they all prayed, then God gave the answer to Daniel. Y'all got me. So, 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 and, I, and then what I did is I went to the Lord. I said, Lord, these are the things that have happened. And so I'm making a decision to close Riverdale. Not close it, but close that building and merge it over here. I said, I'm making a decision to do this based on what we believe. And I said, I have witnesses, me, my wife, Devon, we all believe this. I said, so I'm moving forward. So I'm moving forward. So if you don't want me to do this, you're going to have to really get my attention because you made it clear what I'm supposed to do. Y'all got that? See, those are the ways. See, the church is not familiar with the ways of the Lord. They're just familiar with the actions. Okay? <clears throat> so, so this is where we are. Um, at this point, the ministry is going to be again to operate in something called the ancient future. Where we are in the future, but we will begin to employ ancient ways but they will become a little bit more modern. And so the church has lost that. Catholic church tries to do it a little bit with their, uh, with the robes and the styles and stuff. But, uh, but uh, um, there are no new demons. And, and these things are now doing, so some of the stuff that you see popping up in the planet is a result of what happened during the days of Molech and Baal raw witchcraft and and this stuff has come back around because the, the the culture is opening up the floodgates for demons that were down for a moment how I many you know you know when all you got you know is a farm and a horse and a buggy and some chickens ain't too much the demons can do you know what i'm saying it's that make the rooster get up at four o'clock in the morning and wake you up but now because of all of this technology and you know everything is just going down and the further it goes down the more it opens up portals for what was ancient to now awake. And so, and, and, and the church right now, I hate to say it this way, my and large is kind of stuck on stupid. Okay. And, uh, and so we're going to employ ancient things in a modern way. So let me tell you where we are right now. Okay? I want to, because um, when God does something like this, he has an agenda. Um, and so I can't stop thinking about it. I know the Lord wants to do something with this building to make a statement. You know, and so it'll be after the order of the tabernacle in the Old Testament, and it'll be after the order of the sanctuary that Solomon built. Yeah. And, 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 and when they built them things, every inch of it was for glory. Uh, God told them, follow these instructions. I'm having you do this for glory and beauty. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. So I want to help you understand, because there's something that we're going to do in the beginning, something we're going to do in the middle, and something we're going to do at the end. So I, yeah, some of y'all remember what happened after the temple was done. Oh, Lord, we got to get some more Bible reading up in this piece. Second Chronicles 1, 1 through 3. Oh, I'm, I'm almost done. We just, just, I'm just letting you know what we're getting ready to do. Solomon, son of David, took... And so remember, this, in, some ways, in some ways, this is kind of talking about me as a leader and the group as a whole. Solomon, son of David, took firm control of his kingdom. For the Lord his God was with him and made him very powerful. Solomon called together all the leaders of Israel, the generals, the captains of the army, the judges, and all the political and clan leaders. Then he led the entire assembly to the place of worship in Gibeon, for God's tabernacle was there. 
This was the tabernacle that Moses, the Lord's servant, had made in the wilderness. Second Chronicles 1 6. There in front of the tabernacle, Solomon went. So before Solomon started doing anything, he went up to the bronze altar in the Lord's presence and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings on it. So this is what you will call a special offering. Now, we are going to do it, but when you see how you're going to do it, you're like, Jesus getting ready to do something. Because these offerings that these people have nowadays, this is just foolery. They're having special offerings, and the Lord didn't even tell them to build what they're trying to build. You know, and playing these games. I talked to somebody, and he's like, dude, I went to a church, and they had like three, four offerings. I said, yeah. Yes, they're trying to hope. Never mind. Let me just be quiet and just hush my mouth on that. Okay, so Solomon burnt a thousand offerings on it. Now watch this. After that big offering, the night that night God appeared to Solomon and said, what do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. How many of you would like Jesus to appear to you? That's crazy. For some of y'all, that's dangerous. <laughs> I know for me, that's dangerous. I'd be like, Jesus, I need you to come back in about 30 minutes and I'll have the answer. <laughs> but I want you to think about a sacrifice that you give and it gets God's attention that he shows up like a genie in the bottle. Whatever you ask me, it's done. Man, I was like, hold on, hold that thought, God. <laughs> I got to think about this, because I got to get this right. First question is, how many choices, how many answers do I get? One. Okay, but that night, God appeared to Solomon after that sacrifice and said, what do you want? See, let me tell y'all something. A lot of people are going to be mad at me, but... but if God is really in you giving some type of offering and really giving you some type of sacrifice, when you do it, it's supposed to trigger something afterwards. I told you one time, I got caught up, and I'm not mad at them. TBN, they were doing a commercial, and they had a guest speaker raising offerings. And that's no problem, because you got to keep that you know, television alive. And, and, and man, they got to preach in and all that type of stuff. Next thing you know, I went and gave $1,000 to TBN. Three months later, I saw the same thing. I saw it was a rerun. Now, did I give live or did I give during the rerun? <laughs> I wasn't mad at him, though. <laughs> so there are offerings and sacrifices that can literally move God off his throne. Verse 8, Solomon replied to God, you showed, because God said, what do you want? Now watch this. He said, you showed great and faithful love to David, my father, and now you have made me king in his place. Oh, Lord God, please continue to keep your promise to David, my father. But you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me the wisdom and knowledge to lead them properly. Properly. For who could possibly govern this great people of yours? God said to Solomon, because your, I swear I missed it, because your greatest desire is to help people. It wasn't his only desire. He wanted to be rich. He wanted to be powerful. But his greatest desire was to do right by people. Y'all see that? Because So it's okay that you have the other desires, because I'm going to give you them, <laughs> since they're less than your greater desire. But since your greatest desire is to help your people, and you did not ask for wealth, riches, fame, or even the death of your enemies, because God knew he wanted that too, or long life, but rather you asked for wisdom and knowledge to properly govern my people. I will certainly give you the wisdom and knowledge you requested, but I will also give you wealth, riches, and fame, such as no other king has had before you or will ever have in the future. It's crazy. God asked him, I'll give you anything. The man just simply says, well, I have desires, but the one that's most important is to treat your people right. God says, okay, well, cool, I'll give you that, and no one will ever have wisdom like you. Um... And then he said, but I'm going to give you everything else that's in your heart, too. He was the greatest king that ever lived when it came to wisdom, except for one. Y'all remember what Jesus said when he, when he showed up? Uh, greater than Solomon is here. Amen. <laughs> the scripture, I will tell you. I will certainly give you. So, he ret so verse 13, Solomon returned to Jerusalem from the tabernacle at the place of worship in Gibeon, and he reigned over Israel. And then he said, let's get started. Second Chronicles 2, 1 through 2. Solomon decided to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord and also a royal palace for himself. Now watch this. To build the temple, he enlisted a force of 70,000 laborers. 
70,000 people who were going to work on the temple at the same time. Then another 80,000 men to quarry stone in the hill country. So 70,000 were to work on the temple. 80,000 men, do you know what quarry stone means? It means 80,000 men were picked to dig in the hills and look for gold, silver, rubies, silver, gold, precious metals. That 80,000 people, it was their only job is to dig into the earth and look for stuff. Look for precious stuff that we can add to this building. You understand this? That's crazy. And then he had 3,600 managers. I mean, that's a lot of people. Second Chronicles 2, 3. Solomon also sent this message to King Hiram at Tyre. Send me cedar logs. This is him building up the temple. See, so uh, when you read this, now, we, we, never mind. God is getting ready to do a modern version of the same thing here. Amen. But you got to do it the right way. Amen. You can't do it by having special offerings. Because okay. Okay. there ain't nobody got the money to afford what God is getting trying to do. So you got to follow the way in which you do the thing properly. The last thing you do right now is tell other people to start giving to a building fund. For what? God hasn't given any instructions. And maybe he doesn't want a building fund. Bishop Oyedipo said he was sitting around. Lord told him, hey, you got a service on Saturday morning. He said, yeah. He said, I want you to do one offering for an airplane. Raise $10 million on a Saturday morning. He still don't know how that happened. He said it wasn't even a regular church service. He said, the Lord told me to tell y'all it's time for us to have a corporate plane to be able to do what we need to do. And the Lord told me to do one offering. So whatever you want to do, just whatever you want to do. Raised over $10 million for an airplane. See, when you do it the Lord's way, it don't have to be any. But when you don't do it the Lord's way, you got to switch the gimmicks. The Lord told me in the name of E that for the next six months, everybody is supposed to give $101.13. Hallelujah. God has spoken. Let me get this right. The Lord said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand does. And whatever you give in secret, I will reward you openly. So if that's what he said in the word, then why is the Holy Ghost breaking the word and telling you what I got in my pocket? That sounds like witchcraft to me. Whatever. I've been there. I mean, I went to a church one time, and the guy preached, and then uh, churches, never mind, he preached, and then uh, he said it's offering time. He said, if you're a man in here and you don't have $50 to give in the offering, you're not a real man. <laughs> I had a whole lot more than 50 I didn't give a penny. Church was closed in three years. So I call that a bad investment. <laughs> Whatever. So look, just look, look at the honor and the world of this when it comes to the things of God. Solomon also sent this message to King Hiram. Now, he already got 70,000 people here, 80,000 people here, another 3,600 3, here. Then he sent a message to another king. Send me cedar logs as you did for my father David when he was building his palace. I am about to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord my God. It will be a place set apart to burn fragrant incense. That's prayer to display the special sacrificial bread, that's the word, and to sacrifice burnt offerings each morning and evening, that's the prosperity, on the Sabbath, the new moon celebrations, and at the other appointed festivals of the Lord our God. He has commanded Israel to do these things forever. I'm doing this based on command, not an idea. This must be a magnificent temple. Everybody say magnificent. magnificent. This place is going to be magnificent. It's not going to be one thing in this place. It's going to be poverty. Amen. Not one thing. Amen. Not one. Amen. I'd already thrown out half the building. <laughs> I was walking through here with JD the other day. You open up a closet. Yep, all that goes right in the trash. But, yep, all that goes right in the trash. I'm not interested in nothing old. Well, you know the church needs to? No, the church needs to get everything new. Amen. That's the decision that I made. Don't be bringing us none of your old clothes. Don't be bringing us no old tables to fill no rooms. No, no, don't bring none of that. Matter of fact, don't bring nothing. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, never mind. Let me just be quiet. There are, there are some things when the Lord is trying to do. You, we all, the Lord is trying to do a new thing. He's trying to do a new thing. Yeah, he's trying to do a new thing. And there are some things that God tries to do. He tries to make a statement. He needs people to drive past this place. Mama, yeah. Why is it every time we drive past this place, it feels like a hand is trying to pull me inside? 
He tried to do something with this place where people just come in and they just drive in. The, but that already happens. They drive in the parking lot. How'd you find out about it? As I didn't, I drove past and something told me to come in. Amen. But looks get people. How many of you, you won't eat that food if it doesn't look right? I don't care how many five-star reviews y'all got on this restaurant. What is this mess right here? This does not look right. Now, this is my favorite food, but this looks like it's getting ready to change. And, and, I asked, I asked one of the single girls in here one time. It was a single guy that showed up. I was like, I wonder if she might like him. And so, so I asked her, I said, so what do you think about him? She said, mm, 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 mm. No. I don't care how nice he is. I got to look at him every day. Now, remember, beauty is in the, behind, uh, uh, is the eye of the beholder. So one man's, let me just stop. <clears throat> I don't even know where I am. What verse am I in, Lerona? Ah, uh, thank you. This must be a magnificent temple because our God is greater than all the other ones. When, when you look at the Buddhist temples, man, them things are beautiful. You look at the Hindu temples, man, them, the Hindu temple in Riverdale, one of them is the third largest in the world. You look at those temples and you look at the, some of the Muslim temples overseas, man, it's like, What? And so the Lord is like, I sure wish somebody would catch the vision that I want to outdo them. Verse 6, though. But who can really build him a worthy home? All of the Hindu and Buddhist buildings, they, that, that's worthy because they God and they're not even living. That's the, oh, shoot. Those are the buildings that are worthy of a dead God. So what is the building for a living one supposed to look like? Got a building for somebody that don't even exist. <laughs> and making it glorify, just glorifying the thing. You go past some Hindu temples, it's just like, man, in the Buddhist temples, way up in the mountains, mystical, everything. Got fancy drums and, oh, never mind, let me just. But who can really build him a worthy home? Not even the highest heavens can contain him. So who am I to consider building a temple for him except as a place to burn sacrifices to him? So he sent me a master craftsman who can work with gold. Listen to what he said. So, so he sent me. So, no, he said, so send me a master craftsman who can work with gold, silver, bronze, and iron, as well as with purple, scarlet, and blue cloth. He must be a skilled engraver who can work with the craftsmen of Judah and Jerusalem. No, in other words, uh, don't bring me no heathen to touch this building. Who were selected by my father David. Also send me cedar, cypress, red sandalwood logs from Lebanon. Y'all don't even know what type of wood this is because they don't sell this at Walmart and Home Depot. For I know that your men are without equal at cutting timber in Lebanon, and I will send my men to help them. An immense amount of timber will be needed, for the temple I am going to build will be very large and magnificent. Second Chronicles 3, 1 through 10. Hey, some of y'all need to catch a hold of this for your own address, for your own business, for your own future ministry. Second Chronicles 3. So Solomon began, same way we are, he began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. So one of, that's the name of my oldest child. That's how it's spelled. It means this is the mountain where God is my teacher. That's what the word Moriah means. Where the Lord had appeared to David, his father, the temple was built on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, the site that David has selected. The construction began in mid-spring, the same way that this is now mid-spring during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. These are the dimensions Solomon used for the foundation of the temple of God, using the old standard of measurement. It was, this is the foundation. It was 90 feet long and 30 feet wide. Hey, just to let y'all know something. So to, to give you scope of what my, our father is building with his sanctuary, 
the Empire, the Empire State Building, the Empire State Building, I believe that the foundation for the Empire State Building is 10 meters deep. The one for you to boast church is 40. <laughs> and the Lord told him, he said, Lord told him, he said, hey, in the last days, I'm building empires. He said, in the last days, he said, churches will become whole nations and cities. You remember what they said about King Demon? They said, we got to protect you because they said, if you die, it's like a whole nation dying. Hey, there's some of you, you're getting ready to walk in the greater capacity of just one. You're getting ready to walk in the capacity of 10, capacity of 100, capacity of 1,000. And some of us are going to be a whole nation. I'm trying to be a whole solar system up in this piece. I'm just. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. 90 feet long, 30 feet wide. The entry room of the front of the temple was 30 feet wide running across the entire width of the temple and 30 feet high. He overlaid the inside with pure gold. Stop right there. I want you to understand, he overlaid the entire inside with pure gold. He paneled the main room of the temple with cypress wood, which is the best wood that you can buy. Then overlaid the best wood that you can buy with fine gold and decorated it with carvings of palm trees and chains. He decorated the walls of the temple with beautiful jewels and with gold from the land of Parvaim. We don't even know where Parvaim is. He overlaid the beams, thresholds, walls, and doors throughout the temple with gold. And he carved figures of cherubim, which is a type of angel, on the walls. He made the most holy place 30 feet wide, corresponding to the width of the temple and 30 feet deep. He overlaid its interior with 23 tons of gold. Do you realize how insane that is? It's insane if you have 23 tons of wood. 23 tons of gold? We need to find out where they were getting this gold from. That's what we need to do. We might have to take a trip to Mecca or something. I'm just... <laughs> Look at this, verse nine. The gold nail. Even the nails were gold. The, the gold nails that were used weighed 20 ounces each. He also overlaid the walls of the upper rooms with gold. He made two figures shaped like cherubim, overlaid them with gold, and placed them in the most holy place. How I many know that's crazy? This is what I mean by the ancient future, is that the Lord wants to do... Now, let me say something. I slowed down when it comes to doing the decorations in this and all that. Um, cause I said, you know what? I think I would rather the Lord give me a vision of what it's supposed to look like. Now what's deep is the pastors that turned it over to us, his, the Lord already gave his wife a version of what, a vision of what it looks like. She said, she pulled up to the building and she said, words can't describe how beautiful this thing was. She said, you just, just make your mouth drop. She said the beauty and the grand, she said it was just unbelievable. And then she said this, and I'm not going to tell you. See, there's a wisdom here, you all where everybody got to be sensitive. Everybody has to be sensitive all the way down to when this turns to Lionheart Church, it'll be the third name change. It'll be my third ordination. It's, there's something much bigger going on. You know, so we got to be very, very careful, move slow, tactfully, humbly, <laughs> meekfully. I know that's not a word. I'm trying to come up with synonyms that all have to do with humility. Lowly. Okay, so... So this is where we end. We are going to do an offering on May the 5th. It will only be cash. Can I send a check? No. What if I don't have cash? Then you have nothing to give. You got one month. Whatever is in your heart. We're going to have one. You know, I've never done this. I've never done this. I, never, I don't think I've ever done an offering, a special offering in 11 years, have I? Uh, see, when you, never mind. So it'll be May 5th. Cash. Can I cash app? No, I didn't say cash app. I said cash. And an envelope. Cash, envelope. <laughs> That's it. No checks, no money orders, no, no traveler's checks, no cash app, no Zelle, no coupons, <laughs> no gift cards. Cash. For you that are online, and, we, and, and, guess, and when we give it, it'll only be given on that day. Can I give it early? No. It must be given on May 5th. Y'all got me? Hmm? What'll be that weekend? Yeah, well, 
Yeah. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. But that'll be okay because we'll for Sunday. But here it'll be May, it'll be May fourth. So it'll be that May fourth, fifth weekend. Y'all got me. Thank you. So, whatever the amount you got, four weeks to determine what that is. It's the amount that you set. We not. Y'all got me. It's the amount, whether it's a dollar, or whether it's ten thousand. That's up to you. Okay. You go before the Lord and say, Lord. Sometimes he'll tell you, sometimes it'll be in your heart. You'll have a figure there. And, and get out of this thing that if you have two figures, the lower one is the devil. No, that came from greedy preachers. <laughs> you ever heard that before? You do an offering. If, if you've got two figures, the, the lower one is the devil. No, it's not. First of all, I wouldn't have two figures. I would usually only get one. But see, that's people trying to pull stuff out of you. God doesn't need your money. If you think God needs your money, you're sadly mistaken. Okay, so, but this is what we're going to do, is that, let me show you this first. Let me show you these pictures. You know, we take care of churches in Zimbabwe, and we take care of churches in Africa, and I got to do a better job of showing this, and so put up the first picture. So this young, I told you the story of this young man who reached out to me named Joshua, and he was getting on my last nerves. Literally, he's getting on my nerves. And this is, my wife will tell you, it's a lot if you're getting on my nerves. And I'll see the phone, ugh, 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 you know. Until the Lord gave me a vision in the midst of that, ugh, I was in heaven, and Jesus was standing there, and Joshua was standing there. And the only thing the Lord said to me is, he said, if you would have only helped him, and then the vision ended. That broke me down. That broke me down. The Lord was showing me my future loss if you don't adjust. How many know, no matter how nice you are, there is a person that can get on your nerves, or you're just being intolerant. You know, and so, so I did a test with him at first, and I sent him some Bibles. And that's what happened is after I sent him some money for some Bibles, I think $300 for my own personal money or something, I don't know. It might have been the church's money. It doesn't matter. And, and uh, <laughs> I don't know why I give you all the details that have nothing to do with anything. So after I sent him the Bibles, that's when he was hitting me up, man, like I had his lottery ticket. And I was already apprehensive because, you know, um, the number one scams, the number one and two scams come out of um, Africa, specifically Nigeria, and Pakistan and India. Um, the majority of your scams come out of Nigeria and India. And so, uh, so, you know, so I sent him the money through Western Union or something. I said, take a picture of everything. So long story short, this is him. I sent him just a few money to buy a few Bibles. So this is the picture of them, you know, and those are the Bibles that they have. Boom, okay? And so, so then I moved it up a little bit. Let's go to the next picture. And so those are all of the orphans. Those are all of the children that do not have parents. And, and this boy with the other preachers, and what, he trying to feed, that's just something, he trying to feed all, this is them having a church service on a Sunday morning. Okay, and go to the next one. And so this is, I think, when we had sent them money because none of the kids were going to school. Over there, there is no public and private. There is only pay. And if you don't go to school, you will sit at home for the next 10 years if you don't have the money. Over here, we have options, and then abuse that. Okay, so this is when we had first started sending them a little. We just did a little bit at the time. You know, go to the next picture. And so there you see we've kind of elevated. They had food to eat. They didn't have any food. Um, and we got them some uniforms to be able to go to school. And so that's a few of them there. Um, they send the pictures, of course, in their granny because they don't have top-of-the-line phones. Go to the next one. And so, so they had one toilet that is outside. And because they've been using it so long over there in that area, you, you, a toilet is a hole you dig. And when that thing is full, you now no longer have a toilet. And so he requested, hey, you know, so long story short, he wanted one extra, they wanted another toilet. So that was the first hole that they started building. And so, so we sent them money to do four toilets. Two for the girls, two for the boys, and we also sent them money to build outside showers. Got me. And then let's go to the next one. And so those are the little mud houses that they stay in with tin roofs. So, uh, and I think I'm getting my stories mixed up. No, we got, yeah, we got beds for them and stuff. Yeah, we did. So we sent beds for them because they, they're sleeping. They stand in a mad, mud hot sleeping on the dirt. No covers, no nothing, no nothing. So I did this very, very, very small at first. And then, 
you know, I kind of fell back into the trap of him always calling me. And I didn't have an attitude, but I would just ignore it, 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 just ignore it. And then eventually he would send me a text. We ran out of food. So the cool thing is when I went to Oyedipo's church, there was a couple there, and she's Kenyan. Got a whole ministry in that area for doing this type of stuff. So there was the Lord helping me. Okay, now I have a person to trust. She has a whole ministry, so I send the money to her, and they take care of it. Y'all got me. And so that's why we've been able to do this. But I just fell into that trap again. And so this is what we're going to do. Is that as how many of you know that Solomon, he sacrificed an offering to God of a thousand animals. Do you realize how long it takes to kill a thousand animals and put them on an altar and burn them? That, that itself is crazy. And so, uh, and so how many know that because of that sacrifice, he got God's attention the next night? Next night, right? I hope it was the next night. It was one of those nights. So how many of you know that if you buy a brand new house, it makes sense for you to start spending money on that house? How many know that if you get a big old building like this, that it makes money to start building on and build, spending money on this building? So what if we start this out like Solomon did and we sacrifice and we do one special offering Everybody gives the amount that they want to give, and zero of it goes to this building. It all goes to them. God's Tammy. Now, the reason I say that is, is that they text me, and they said, sir, we're in the rain season. The rainy season is really bad over there. And so it rains, and because of those mud houses and the little tin roofs, all the orphans are getting wet with rain all day. And they said, if you could, they said, if you could just build us a house. I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember if just the material, and watch this, to build them a whole house, I think, cost $3,600. The whole house for all of the orphans. So, I, uh, so, you know, how many know there are actions, and then there's a way in which you do something. And the pattern in Scripture to do it the best way is right there, but it requires you to follow it. So I think it would be wisdom that before we even think about doing anything on this building, that, and let me read this scripture. These are the last two, Ephesians 6, 8. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bound or free. Uh, so maybe if we build them a whole building and they don't have to pay a dime, then maybe we may not be surprised if somebody give us 10 million and we never have to have an offering. You understand what I'm saying? So here's your heart motive for that. Last one, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. Remember this, because remember, offering is something above the tithe. Always remember that. Remember this. That's why it's a sacrifice. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. See, this is what... How many, see, y'all, how many of you know in the natural there's a time to sow and a time not to sow? I dare you to go out there in January and start uh, sowing some tomato seeds. You're going to get embarrassed. See, so in the same way in the spirit, there's a time to sow and then there's a time you don't have to. So what you do is, okay, what is the season to sow over something like this? <clears throat> you must, here we go. Here's the integrity. You must each decide in your heart, your heart, not what the preacher put in your heart. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Oh, y'all ready for it? And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure because God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So if you're happy about giving God $10 for this project, he will receive that happily because that's what you want to give. Well, somebody else gave $500. That's because that's what they were happy to give. He said, you make a decision and... I ain't got to read this all over and over again. Y'all know how to read. <laughs> Verse 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Why? Because you did it for somebody else. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. So this is an issue of what you do with the poor to get the biggest type harvest. Their good deeds, this is, this is eternal stuff, and what you do will be remembered forever. 
Not forever on planet Earth, forever. So whatever you do, apparently they're going to be celebrations for you forever like a birthday based on what you do in these particular things. Can y'all remember the, can y'all imagine the celebrations and the parties in heaven? No, no, you can't. And people say, you know, some people will be like, Lord, send me planet Earth. I didn't even know y'all partied up here like this. Y'all just sitting up here. I'm thinking y'all will be, oh, no, no, that, yeah, y'all did that. I uh, can't remember one guy, he said he was up in heaven. He said there is a dance, is one of the favorite dances that the angels love to see the children of God do. And it came from an African tribe. Okay. There's a time to dance and there's a time to, uh, what verse am I in? For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving when it's done the right way the needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And then watch this. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. I'm very, very grateful for this man that God connected me to. He was the one who told me, he said, there are some things you can do to invite people to church. He said, then there are other things you can do when people invite themselves. And that the season that we're in is people just invite themselves. And that's a good thing. You don't have to broadcast yourself. Or it was, it was easy. You know, to be, be honest with you, the day for pounding on doors is pretty much over. You know, it doesn't really work too much anymore. But, but in the same way, there are things you can do to raise money, and then there are other things you can do, and God raises the money for you. And what's beautiful about this is that it's individual. Whoever participates, then they will get the benefit based on what they do. And so that's what we're going to do. So, and the reason... I'm saying cash on May the 4th and 5th and put it in an envelope is that way we know that's exactly what that's for. If everybody started giving them now, now and then and let me tell you something, people mess themselves up by not following directions. So for you that are online, listen very carefully. Whatever you decide to collect because you'll have to give it online. You cannot give it until May 5th. Don't be sending it in early. No, because um, we need to be able to accurately look at who gave to this effort so that we can give all of it to that effort. You understand what I'm saying? And if we don't do it that way, then it creates too much confusion. Okay? And so it's on May 5th. Well, what if I give after that? It'll just go to the general fund. We take care of people all of the time anyway. It's going to, so I'm going to send that to them, and then I don't care if it's $50,000. It's all going into that account. I don't care how much it is. It's all going into that account. Y'all, there are some things that you got to start doing where you live above the normal order of things. There, there are some things you got to do scared. There are some things you got to start doing that don't make no common sense. You got to start doing, you got to just start doing stuff like, like, Lord, if this is a hundred grand, it's all going to them. Oh, I, I need you to get some extra uh, uh, foundations for your church because what I'm getting ready to pour it on you, boy, y'all don't understand. Because I can't explain what's coming upon me. What this is that's coming upon me that's for the purpose of just embarrassing Satan. Amen. This, this is, this is going to make a statement that ain't never been made. It's, and in order to make those type of statements, you got to be connected to people that's making them type of statements already. Amen. How are you going to build a sanctuary that can actually see? You can put 170,000 people in this thing. Y'all familiar with the Mercedes Benz Stadium? I've told this before, but some of you haven't heard it. The Mercedes Benz Stadium downtown, and this thing is about 40 to 50 times larger than that. When I see that Mercedes-Benz stadium, I'm like, this thing is a sign and a wonder. 
Yeah, but the one over there, you can fit this in there twice. Solar panels on the outside. Foundation 40 meters deep. Two helipads on top of the church so you can drop in on helicopter. 126 escalators. 1,200 bathrooms. It's an, and they work on it 24 hours, seven days a week. 24 hours, seven days a week. And, and leave me ask my wife like I'm some, you, they work, now imagine something that big. If you work on something that big, how many of you know that's a lot of noise? Every time we go visit it, we stand right there, you can't hear nothing. You see the men, but you hear nothing. It's like it's an invisible barrier. And, and, and oh, you told us we were in the office, he said, we don't build churches here, we grow them. When they built the 50,000 seat, uh, seat sanctuary, the Lord told, remember when he, the Lord took him to the spot where he said, this can't be it? He said, not only is it it, he said, you're going to build the largest church in the planet Earth in one year, debt free, without a loan, and no money from America. He said, when he first got rid of pastor years ago, he was going to move to America because back then, all of the good churches were in America. And the Lord told him, unpack your bags. He said, good churches don't come from America. They come from above. Amen. See, we, we, it's, you got to do it. The... Y'all got that? So it's, uh, it's um, and so he, uh, they built that 50,000 seat sanctuary. He called, I believe they said, I know they called builders in the United States, China, the UK, and I believe it was Canada. And then they just stopped because the best building companies in the world said, sir, we cannot build a building like that in less than three years. He said, you're wrong. The one from above told me one, sir, that's impossible. So he said, forget all y'all. He, so he went to the small builders at his church. He said, we're going to come together. We're going to build this thing. They built this thing in a year. And they built it. And uh, I talked to a lady. This is a lady that worked directly under him. She said, sir, you don't understand. She said, God built that building for real. She says, imagine putting up a brick. And you go back to put another one, three up here. Because God gave the timeline, therefore he's responsible for building it. And Oyudipo, he said he got to the end of that thing, and he said it was not looking like it was going to be possible to finish this building in a year. He went to God and began to kind of complain about, Lord, it doesn't look like we're going to finish this building in a year. And God told him, he said, son, that's my problem. He said it took me seven, and so it took me six days to create planet Earth and everything in it. To finish your building in three months would take too long. You the one that's afraid. See, there, y'all, there, so let me tell y'all the level we're at. The level that we're moving into, you just got to do it, and, and if we fail, we just fail and start over again. But we, you got to launch yourself out here in order to match this mess out here. Because out here they jump. In the church, they shout. And while the church is shouting, the world is out there jumping into new exploits and new technologies and new this and new that and new this, and they got great faith. And because they, their faith is so great that because they're getting a manifestation, they, they, don't, they know they don't believe in Jesus, so they give praise to the universe. Because somebody is doing this for me. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's why when Moses showed up with Pharaoh, he did a miracle. They said, what? You turning rock, poles into snakes? We've been doing this. Are we supposed to be impressed? They did the same thing several times. So anyway, so y'all got that. So I'll be announcing it every week, both locations. I'll have them announce it to... I'll be, yeah. So that's what we're going to do. It's very, very simple. Whoever doesn't have the ability to do it like they forget, then that's no problem. There are some things you need to take serious. There are some things you need to put on the front of your refrigerator. There are some things you need to pre-program your alarm clock every single day until more, May the 4th or 5th. Ring! Oh, I'm supposed to give in this offering. Ring! Oh, I'm supposed to give in this offering. Ring! You know what? I haven't put it in the envelope yet. Ring! You got to do that. I've done that to myself a couple of times over the years. If you want to do it. Now, let me say this. What did the Bible say? It says, don't do it reluctantly and don't do it under pressure. So if you say out of your mouth, well, you know what? I don't really want to do that right now. I don't have it like that. God does not have a problem with that. That's up to you. That's not being taught. People, people feel like God is mad at them because they couldn't give in some, why? He didn't need your money in the first place. The last time I checked, he said all the silver and the gold is mine. All the cattle on the Fowler Hills is mine. He said, who are you? Don't remember my favorite scripture. If I was hungry and in need, I wouldn't ask you nothing. <laughs> oh, Jesus, that's one of my favorite lines from God. Y'all got me? 
So, so this is how you move with speed versus trying to have a building fund for five years. See what I'm saying? So, in order, for, so the reason why so many churches are dying, they know nothing about the ancient ways. And God is the same yesterday. My ways are not yours. My thoughts are not yours. He said they're higher. Same way the heavens are higher than the earth. You understand what I'm saying? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start this off by doing it that way. And it won't matter if you give a dollar, $5, 500 5000 or 50 It will not matter. It's very simple. Whether you give or not, it won't move God. Whether you give or not, it won't shake God. Whether you give or not, it will not change his opinion and his love and his assessment of you. It's just an opportunity. And when this one comes around, guess what? There'll be another one that comes around. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And then some people, they were like, no. Some people know that there's another level to this where they're like in the season. Well, no, I'm getting ready to systematically start giving to this thing because they know what that means. That's why all of our buildings are always good because we did. We went to a church, and this was integrity. The church, and, and he was working on a project, and he just had people. He said, if there's anybody in here, because he had calculated, there's nothing wrong with that. He said, if there's anyone in here that can give $1,000 to this effort, he said, go ahead and stand. It wasn't for the purpose of showing off. He knew that most people would keep their word, so he would just count to give an assessment of where to go in the future. And so he did that. We gave to that, I don't know, maybe a couple of times or something. And, but because we sold in that season, it helped us explain why no matter what we do, we always get the best building no matter what neighborhood we go to. Yeah, because we were sowing into the best at that time, so we had to reap the best. And how many know when you reap, you don't reap one time, you reap... Y'all understand what I'm saying? I cracked myself getting mad at my own inability to explain a, a, a point. And so that's why it is illegal for you to set an amount as a leader. One person can give $5 million. Another one, watch this, a single mom with kids can give $50. And she gave more than the guy that gave $5 million. Y'all remember them people, that, the, the lady that was in front of the temple? And Jesus was standing. That proves they didn't do offerings in their services either, even though there's nothing wrong with doing that. They had to give on the outside of the temple. And G can you imagine you giving and Jesus just standing there trying to read them out? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come on, you ain't giving about 30 years. Now's your time gone. And it says that the rich folk were cast in the lot. And then that woman, she came up and gave two pennies. And Jesus said, all of them, they gave. He said, but, uh, but they really didn't give much because he gave $10,000, but he got $10 million in the bank. He said, this woman showed up with two pennies, and that's all that she had. So I always remember, it's never the amount. It's this sacrifice that it meant to you personally. That's so important. So for one person, for them, $500 was a sacrifice. Somebody else, $50 was a sacrifice. You understand what I'm saying? It's what the sacrifice means to you based on where you are with your personal income and your personal faith. And, when, and, if, and, and as long as what you do, so watch this. If, <laughs> I shouldn't tell this, but as long, if, you, if you're good, we're like, you know what, Lord? Whew, I'm going to give $50. And I really need this, but this is what I'm giving. Don't give if you start feeling bad about giving 80 don't get religious where you know God needs more. He doesn't need anything. God will tell you, you, you happy about the 50? Yes. That's a sacrifice for you? Yes. And why do you think about 80? Well, you know, I just feel that's your feelings. I know that's not being taught. I know it's not being taught. So some of y'all looking at me like I'm speaking Arabic. But according to the scripture and according to the standard in the Bible, that's exactly how it is. Even the man recognized we're about to build him a magnificent temple. But technically, we ain't about to build him nothing. He said the heavens can't even hold this guy. You understand what I'm saying? So just mark that, mark that. You know, just stay in. And, and I was looking at some of my birthday money in the drawer. Yeah, you got to go, you got to go. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But the question is, you know, let me tell you something. If God never gave anything to you, the honor of being able to partner with him. Amen. See, and watch this. How many know when we build that building for them, then people are gonna cry. So, so guess what? That means God has to do something for you to make you cry. How many know when they get that building built, those people are gonna dance? So God has to do something for you that's gonna make you dance. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? How many know when they get that stuff? Because I'm sure the amount that we will raise will be more than just for a building. How many know when they get it, someone's going to be rolling on the floor? God needs to do something for you that's going to make you roll on the floor in the parking lot. We used to go, you remember, you remember Steve? 
he gets so happy, he just falls on the ground. He would literally roll to this wall, <laughs> roll to the other way. And the usher's just adjusting his feet so he wouldn't hit this. He, we would just sit there and just write the praise words. We just, we, we're supposed to be worshiping God. We're just laughing at Steve going from one wall to the next. <laughs> oh, man. I talked to Vicki Shear one time. She said she was going to make a movie called Church Foolishness. Hilarious. So that's how we're going to start. So that's how we're going to start. Then we're going to do a different dedication, whatever the Lord does, what he does, when we start the outside of the building. The question is, how are we going to act a fool when this thing is done? Oh, yeah, they're they going to hear this all the way in the back hills of China. <laughs> they're going to know something is going on. I know y'all going to act a fool. We're going to have, y'all, we're going to be, let me tell you something. We're going to anoint the property. We're probably going to, that'll be the next thing we do. The next thing we're going to do is, we're not going to do that until it's officially on the paperwork that it is ours. We're working that right now. Once it's ours, we're going to do something where we're going to pour oil around the entire property. Excuse me. Yes, well, the Holy Post said that's why, he said that's why not so much foolishness happens on our property. Every Sunday, the pastors get up, all of that property, and they get up, and they go out there with vats of oil and just pour it on the road. Pour it on the road, dare Satan across. He said the same way that you have bomb deposits over there in the Middle East. He said we got oil deposits on our land. Remember that service we were in? We were in the service. He said there's so much oil on this land. He said everybody take off their shoes right now. Socks and everything. I'm, see, we said Americans, so I take off my shoes but not my socks. They're like, if you don't take them socks off. That's what they told me, right? Sir, take them socks off. And we stand out on there barefoot. He said there's so much oil on this ground. He said let's just stand for a moment and let some of that oil soak into your feet. But we in the sanctuary. Don't matter where you are. We're always trying to adjust stuff scientifically. This is beyond science. This is beyond science and sense. I don't know what's going on out here, y'all. I just know that most of it is failing, and we haven't even moved to the world. Most of it is failing. Hey? Uh, don't be surprised if other churches start joining us. Don't be surprised at that. And to this day, my wife and I talk every day. We just do not, un you, can all, you can give us prophecies all day long. Oh, the Lord trusts you and all that type of stuff. It, I mean, I don't know if people on planet Earth can be trusted. Maybe it really is, is that? I don't know. I just, it's getting bigger, it's getting stronger to the point where I'm like, like, Lord, where is this going? Why in the world did you pick me to do all of this stuff? Why, why am I mentoring 25 pastors? And it's just increasing every single week. And I'm just like, what is going on? And then maybe there's some agenda where something is going to happen and a leader is going to have to raise up and lead everybody. I, I don't know why I'm on the own. There are just a few. Why did I stay open during COVID? Y'all know we thrive during COVID. We acted a fool. We had to throw that hand sanitizer away because nobody used it. You remember that one time we tried, we remember that one service we tried social distancing and we put them tapes and y'all was looking like, Really? I never forget the couple that was over there, and, and they came from a major, major church here, and they had on masks. Nothing wrong with that, but God told me, he said, it's obvious y'all believe what y'all preach. He came from a huge mega church in Atlanta, and he, I, I, I saw it. They were looking like, wow, we're the only two fools that got masks on. <laughs> they said, we're right in the midst of COVID, and nobody has on masks. It's no masks. They're not social distancing. That hand sanitizer out there was on full. They up in here hugging and shaking hands, and what is going on? What was going on? I had to see. Let me tell you, there were there were two stands I had to take. First stand was is I'm a, I'm a, I know it's scary. I know it's dangerous. Every miracle and every story in the Bible was dangerous, including when Jesus laid hands and made a, a, a mud cake on a blind man and told him to go jump in the river. The man could have jumped. He could. So you would have said, Oh no, don't make send that blind man out here. He can't see the water. He might drown. <laughs> Look, don't you take that water and give it to the host because you could get embarrassed. What happens if he tastes water? Every miracle in the Bible, it was dangerous. The one with the issue of blood, she could have been stoned. You know what I'm saying? Many, most of the exploits that were done in Scripture, if it doesn't work, you die. And the church won't do nothing now because they're too afraid, uh, afraid to die. And once you are no longer afraid to die, 
you, could, you become a huge problem for Satan. But too many of us are afraid to die. We, watch this. Too many of us are afraid to lose. Too many are afraid of us. Well, what happened if it doesn't work? Start over. Some of y'all have been through bankruptcy, and now you got another house. Some of you had your car repossessed like me, and now you got another car. You understand what I'm saying? But we're too afraid to lose just for a second to prove how this thing works so we can kick the devil in his teeth. Yeah. Meanwhile, in the world, they're creating spaceships trying to get to another planet to tear up. I can't do that no more. We need to get back to, we need to get back to, we need to get, to, then get back to it. We need to get, to get back to prayer. Then do something called the hour of prayer in the service. We need to get back to integrity. We didn't start living right. We need to get back to the old ways. Then start casting out demons. Stop controlling people and let them act a fool out here on the street. And if they mess up, pick them up and send them back out there again like Jesus did the disciples. Look at me preaching through the mic, holding a coffee cup at the same time. Whatever. Y'all got me? The church is stale right now. Oh, they look good. Just flat out stale. Flat. Don't believe nothing in the Bible except for prosperity. It's crazy, isn't it? And so right in all of the midst of that, then the Lord got these few remnants popping up like this that's going against the entire grain. And, and so how I many know we're going to go against it greatly? It should be obvious by now that nobody can stop us Hallelujah. except ourselves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and stand. Thank you, Jesus. Biggest thing is just for them to bring it, because we'll determine where it goes. And that's that's a possibility. My wife asked if the offering was for Zimbabwe, it's for Kenya, it's for Kenya. But once all of their stuff is met, if there's any overflow, we may just send it towards Zimbabwe. You know, and so, <laughs> speaking of Zimbabwe, <laughs> hey, you didn't even hear your mama's verse when you came down here. She's like, why am I down here? That's funny. Let's lift our hands, give God thanks for a moment, give him praise. Give him glory and give him honor for what the Lord is allowing us to experience. In the midst of failure, he has given us great success. That's actually the theme for this month is success. God's way. Hallelujah. Father, teach us your ways. Help us to follow you, O Lord God, in all that we do. Thank you, O Lord God. We bless and honor your holy and majestic name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, O oh Lord God. Hallelujah. Just for sake of time, I just want to put up these three scriptures for salvation and then lead everyone in a prayer and then we'll get ready to dismiss. First scripture is Romans 4, 7, 8. If there's anyone here that's not saved or you need to rededicate your life to Christ, the Bible says to give God an offering in righteousness. So you take a huge risk giving money to the church and you're not living right. That's a huge risk. It could be perverted seed. Okay. This scripture says here, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven and whose sins are put out of sight. Getting right with God. And it says, yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Being right with God is associated with prosperity and joy and peace and desires being met. Isaiah 30, 18 says, so, the Lord, so now because of this, the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is faithful. He's a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. Romans 3, 22. Actually, let's go to the Romans 10, 9 and 10. Thank you. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart or accepting in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith in a prayer that you are saved. So let's just all bow our head. If you want to get on that prayer, we're all going to repeat it together. Whether you're here or you're online, repeat this prayer. God will forgive you of all of your sins so that you can experience new joy. All of them. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter if you killed somebody. All sins are sin. And they're already paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's something that he did for you because he loved you. 
His ability to see all of us and to see each one of us individually at the same time is beyond me. But repeat this prayer. God is a man of his word. And God will change you. He will forgive you. He will write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Repeat this all together. Say, Father, I accept what Jesus did for me on the cross. He was beaten. He went to hell. And he died for me paying the price for my sin. He went to hell so that I don't have to. So I receive that. I receive his sacrifice as the price for my sins, my forgiveness, and my eternal life. I accept his forgiveness and I accept him into my life, into my heart, into my ways, into my speech thank you that I am forgiven I am cleansed and my name is in the book of life and I will live forever in complete joy and prosperity in Jesus name amen 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 let's lift our hands and give God thanks <clears throat> hallelujah 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 Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, make sure you reach out to us. I'm starting another spiritual growth class tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. on Zoom. The class is specifically for you as well as others. I'll show you what to do. The Bible says when you get your life right, it says desire the sincere milk of the word so that you may grow. The most important thing for you to do now is to grow. You scare your own self to see what you can do if you grow in Christ your abilities, how God will respond to you. Yeah, it's just absolutely amazing. So, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't think I'm, I don't know if I have any announcements or not. We don't need to have no announcements. We Everything is kind of on hold this month except for the classes. But, you know, put up the, if you have it, you can put up the, uh, the announcements for the emails. You can put that up. If you don't have it, Devon, don't worry about it. So, how many of y'all glad y'all came to church today? <laughs> hallelujah. So, just a note, and that is, I told the Riverdale to hold it bay. Same thing with you. You know, um, I don't want to overwhelm them um, yet <laughs> till I kind of build them up. And so, and then the other thing is, is that we encourage you, if Saturdays is good for you, just continue with Saturdays. I'm going to try to build a Sunday and Saturday crowd at the same time. Um, and because I, when I kind of see in the future is maybe doing two services on Saturday, to serve, well, yeah, in the future. Because eventually, so we're going to finish this auditorium. Got the new sound system, got to add a couple more things, then we're going to do a digital wall, and then some extra lights, and then we'll pretty much be set. And then I got to start doing that sanctuary, which is bigger, and the sound system is 25 years old. They say the soundboard just does its own thing. Nom, noms just start moving. <laughs> yeah, you got to go. <laughs> And so, uh, but yeah, so, so you know, I'm sure some of you may want to visit just out of curiosity, but just hold your horses on that right now. But we do encourage you. Now, some of you, there are a few of you that, you know, you're like, well, you know, Sundays is actually much, much better for me. Then that's no problem. You can do that. But if I encourage you to stay on Saturday so we can keep on building this and, um, and uh, doing what the Lord says, because what's coming, you all, there's a little bit of nervousness. I, I always, I never understood what people meant when they said that they were afraid of success. I kind of understand that now, you know, because when the, you can sow so much seed, you can't stop the harvest. You can't stop it. I've always told my wife, there are some things that are going to come to you only when you're prepared for it. There are other things that come and they show up whether you're prepared or not. And so the things that are coming, we had to, we had to start preparing for it because it's like, hey, y'all sold this. It's coming now. You can't pray in tongues for 12 years straight every morning and expect nothing to happen. You understand what I'm saying? So we shall see. But all right, let's go ahead and get rid of it. I'll just say a final prayer. And then, like I said, we'll, uh, if you're a first time, matter of fact, go ahead. If you're a first time visitor or a couple of guests, you all can do that too. Just go out and go to the hallway. They'll send you to the conference room and so that my wife and I can talk to you just for a moment. And so um, y'all just give them a moment so they can exit out. You all can go too. Yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead and go ahead and go now. If you're a first-time visitor, hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. It's crazy. Overwhelming thing over the first time visitors is they say, we just can't find a place that teaches the word. You know, so right now places of teaching was cool, which is relationships and money. And then they still don't have none. I met with a group of pastors one time in Austell years ago. It was a fellowship of pastors. It was a bunch of us. We were at IHOP. And they were sitting around trying to figure out. I said, they said, okay, the summertime is coming. Y'all, what's the best thing we can teach on to get the people to come? And I remember I was just eating my omelet really, really fast. <laughs> Especially when one of them said, and then they were talking about money, how to get money in the church. And I am not lying. Then one of them said, this guy, he got money. He got people sending him money all around the world. He had an attitude, too. And I was just like, well, what am I supposed to do? Send it back? <laughs> anyway, let's lift our hands. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. <laughs> we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in our midst. Help us to protect it and to honor it. Help us to move with speed so that you can make a name for yourself through our actions, through our prayers, through our prosperity. We thank you, Lord God, that this is the season where you are going to bless this congregation and all that are connected to it greatly with speed. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for doing a wonder in the lives of those in Kenya and Zimbabwe. Thank you as we bless them financially, they in turn will go into deep prayer for us. Thank you for this partnership that will be supernatural. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Give someone a high five, a hug. Tell them to have a blessed day. And we'll see you on next weekend.